sofa sonic super sofa sonic sofa sonic sonic hello everybody good evening i'm delighted to introduce this in conversation with steve von till and ina selvik um steve has um is a solo musician performing under the name of harvest man plays with neurosis runs new york recordings and has a new album release no wilderness deep enough and also very first published book um harvest man 23 untitled poems and collected lyrics coming out on neurot on the 7th of august um but for a special um super super a super sonic audience special if you pre-order the book this weekend you will receive a signed printed handbill on french craft tone paper you have to order via fontil.org forward slash store and that sounds beautiful and the book does look really beautiful steve Thank and you. steve you're going to be chatting with einar selvik welcome um einar is one a uh, founding member of vodruna and skugja also a historian with a specialism in norse and rune mythology now there is a new vodruna album due out on the 22nd of january 2021 called covid 11 um and there is already some music out there you could listen to from the record as well and pre-orders are also live and you can find out some more details on the supersonic website um and there'll be plenty of vodruna news between now and release date to get us all excited um so before we kick off the conversation just to let everybody know um there is going to be a little moment at the end for a q and a from the audience so if you have any questions pop them into the youtube chat bar and um we'll try and get to what we can in the time that we have so i over to the conversation and i thought a great way to kick things off would be to look at um the deep awareness you both have for um our relationship with nature and also our connection to our ancient past and so starting maybe with you Steve is this something you could elaborate on um yeah well um i thought a little bit about that before we started and and in relationship to especially my current work um and i think it comes down to i think i have a fundamental belief that all landscapes contain songs and all landscapes contain poems and all landscapes contain art and maybe even architecture um it's the learning how to listen to it and listen for it that is the the hard part and the interesting part for the creative person whether you're a, a musician or a poet or a singer or a artist um And so for me um that comes in different forms obviously the land where I live I've chosen to live for the last 15 years is a more wild part of the United States compared to the cities I came from where I was longing for a connection to nature and uh now that I'm more a part of the seasons more a part of the environment more a part of the landscape it's opened up a new element for me but in talking about no wilderness deep enough this new record i really had to reflect on the origins of it and it actually began uh, at my wife's parents house in north germany uh where her family has lived uh on the same home site there about 30 minutes outside of bremen for over 500 years which even by old world standards that's quite a long time for a family to stay in one home site mm. um and I wasn't choosing to listen to the land the land forced me to listen um at, at that time it's no secret that I'm I have an obsession with ancient mythology and folklore and uh megalithic cultures and and her area is right there in the Strasse der Megalith Kultur um but I was you know it started as just a normal family vacation I was visiting my in-laws you know for our spring holiday and um i had horrible jet lag uh couldn't sleep but i had a simple electronic setup in the corner of my wife's childhood bedroom with a little keyboard and and a computer and headphones and in the delirium of sleeplessness um these simple chord progressions which i would have never chosen to write intellectually 
um, just started flowing through me. And long story short, over that course of that week, I believe the energy of that land uh, was channeling itself through through me, it, through my own, of course, unique filters, my own style, my own choices of of sound and preference. Um, uh, but it kind of came, it came unasked for it. It came just because I was open to the energy. I was open to the flow of the land. And, and that started me on a journey of the whole process of the record of learning to get out of my own way, which I've been learning my entire musical career, le- learn to, to get out of here and get in here and, uh, go with the flow and, 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 uh, yeah, get in, get in flow with the river, get in tune with the, the way the universe is taking me. So, and I, I, when I listen to Wardruna, uh, you know, putting my own um, consciousness into what I'm hearing, I hear a lot of, of uh, alignment with the flow of the universe, alignment with landscapes. And so, uh, yeah, maybe that's a, a connection we share. Absolutely. And um, yeah, I, I, I fully agree that, that, that the landscape and nature has that potential, potential to for you to tune into, but also potential to take you into it. And 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 of course, um, for me as well, um, growing up here in Norway, and and uh, that that's something. I don't know that sense of place um, and place in time is, I guess, something that's that's been been. Uh, a big part of me as well in, in terms of being, being, um, yeah, as a child being, being, um, told, yeah, stories from, from, uh, from ancient times. I had people in my close family who, who had a lot of knowledge on, on, on the old sagas and so on. So whenever we were on holiday or just out walking, uh, in the landscape, I would, get these stories about what had happened here like thousands of years ago. And, and, um, I don't know, at the time I didn't reflect much upon it, but in, in, in my early teens, when I sort of found my, my interest for that part of history on my own, I, I found that there's a lot of these images that the story is created and the landscapes created, they, they had stuck, um, and, and were, quite quite a powerful thing um in in my music it's it's you know i i i use this old norse wrapping around it but it's on so many levels it's universal themes that i'm working with it's universal universal mechanisms um timeless mechanisms i would say because um culture and tradition that's that's um, molded by by its surroundings by the where it arises uh, nature and its resources it's it's um, challenges and so on that's what creates traditions and and culture and and so being being part of those same landscapes that um that created these stories, which we have, I have to say, we have a broken line. Uh, we are on many levels very disconnected to it, but the nature is still there. Um, you know, the, the very the very stuff that once, uh, once created it, it, they are still there. And, and so that means that you can tap into it still. Um, you can go into the same processes that that once created it and and that that's a good way of of understanding um the things that lie behind it uh, and and also determining what's what's relevant and what's not relevant anymore um uh which is a, also a big part of it in in my view and in in my music it's uh i'm not trying to uh recreate music or or atmosphere from any specific time period it's more about um creating something from the now from that timeless uh, 
uh, yeah, from nature and and in animistic cultures all over this planet, you have what you 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 were talking about initially as well. This um, uh, song seeking um, in in uh, the esoteric traditions of Sc- Scandinavia, you see see it all the time. Also in the old stories that you. Uh, you you seek out uh, medicine songs or or uh, healing songs or um, if if you want to uh, if you want to cure the snake bite you know you need to know the song for the snake you need to know the snake if you if you want to know the river you need to know its song and and so on um, um, I I don't know I find these things very very inspiring. And um, it's it's an uh, it's it's a constant um, constant uh, source basically. There's no limitations. Yeah, I agree 100. percent Yeah, it's uh, that um, when you said the song seeking, it, it reminded me of something I heard someone say uh, the other day. Um, I forget who it was, but. Uh, um, so that, that perhaps that idea of seeking the song in the landscape or, or discovering the poem in the landscape is actually the origin of all language, of all poetry, of all art, because there's a point in human evolution in which we went beyond the need to just point to our mouth or our stomach and, and discuss our basic, most primal need to discussing something more esoteric, like our place in the universe, like our place in the landscape, like uh, contemplating the stars or, or uh, the, the relationship between all things. You know, I mean, there, there's no part of the river that is not also a part of me. There's no part of the mountain that is not also a part of me. We're all made of the same elements. Uh, and if you look at those ancient mythologies and the animistic traditions you're talking about, the stories reflect that, you know, like, like your own country, uh, the, the gnomes and trolls and giants and elves, it, it, you know, it all seems like those were just ways of speaking of the, of the spirits of the land and the spirits of the earth and the energies of all things that we are all connected to and all related to. Um, yeah. I, I, what connects it all is empty space. <laughs> like, like uh, all matter. It's, it's the empty space within that binds it all um, but yeah in in a in a Finnish mythology you also have the this thing where where um, I think it goes like uh, uh, yeah if you know the oldest word for iron then you know how to make iron and and that's also connected to this uh, song seeking and and um, and I find it interesting also if you go to proto uh, scandinavian or 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 proto germanic languages they are they are consisted of of there seem to be a, a pattern where where uh, they are constructed of quite a lot of syllables uh more syllables than for instance norse uh, old norse um and and where every where the root of every syllable um seem to contain different well different qualities of what of the meaning of the word how it's constructed now imagine if you go back to 10 10,000 years before that even how was the language back then i would presume even longer and um and that's kind of the idea where 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 these um yeah, if you know the oldest word for a thing or the oldest song for a thing, then you know it. That's an incredible idea. I'm going to remember it's, that. It's one. a beautiful idea. <clears throat> um, do you, so going back to that way that, that the landscape might inspire our, our music, um, uh, I find, and I'm sure you, you probably feel similar, that, that different landscapes bring out different energies. Um, I don't know what, what your home area is like uh, in what part of Norway you are, but um, um, like, for example, here, I'm in the Rocky Mountains, and so it's a very young mountain range. It's very tall and pointy and, and uh, uh, hasn't been 
changed by um, hasn't been manipulated by humans for as long because the indigenous people here didn't really manipulate the landscape uh, the way we did in the future. Um, so in some parts, it's quite a bit more wild. And and when I was doing my last music in that part of Germany, I was talking about mm. that area has been cultivated for so long. I mean, like, from that megalithic culture up until the last 500 years of her family, like that soil, there, there's nothing wild <laughs> left about that region. That has just been farmed and populated, not, you know, densely populated, but has been manipulated by human hands uh, for so long. It, it seemed to have a, like a heavier air, a heavier density, a heavier energy um, tied, tied to huma the humanity of the place as well. Like in the, as opposed to perhaps if I go hiking in the mountain here and I feel more the energy of that I'm in, I'm in nature's house. I haven't turned nature into well, my house. Well, it's, uh, I think that's an interesting thing also because we, I, th I think that many things in modern animism is perhaps even flipped upside down to what, uh, to what it used to be because um, back then uh, you, you, you didn't have a romantic idea towards nature. Nature was something you had to tame. You had to fight it. And it was actually the cultivated earth that was the sacred one, the one you used for healing and so on. The wild, that was uncontrollable. That was dangerous and, and something they, they sought to control or to a certain degree, it was more wild. But, and, and it's interesting to see how, how, how the need has, has Flipped, uh, uh, flipped it all around and, and uh, flipped around modern paganism to be in many ways the opposite of, of what it used to be. Because for us, we need to romanticize uh, about nature. We need the, the, the wildness and, and the un, untouched mountains and, and forests. Um, uh, yeah, I do find that very logical, but also interesting to, to reflect yeah, interesting to look at from that way. Because yeah, there's a whole rewilding movement, like to try to connect humans back to nature, even, uh, even outside of, of modern paganism. There's just people yeah. longing for some sort of sense of of the feral nature yeah. of uh, uh, of ourselves. I suppose is what we're ultimately looking for. Is that part of ourselves that we feel that we've lost or lost connection to? Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I definitely think. That's a, a, a big part of it. We have some questions coming in. If either of you, I've got one for each of you actually. One for Einar maybe to start with. Um, how did you study to learn the Norse language? Um, well, that's, um, I didn't study in any school. Um, I, I'm, I, I didn't go to university. So it's, it's all done. Um, on on uh, on my own, and uh, I'm very lucky to have a lot of um, a lot of uh, uh, friends uh, who are who are um, academics, uh, very good experts, and and uh, have been yeah not teaching me, but uh, teaching me how to teach myself in, in a way uh, and uh, 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 yeah, pointing me towards uh, good sources and, and, and so on. And that applies not only to, to, to language, I would say that applies to, to rhinology and, and other, other parts of historical research, uh, musicology uh, as well. I, I learned at a, I was lucky that I was uh, um, pointed in that direction, even in my early teens. That, um, yeah, don't don't go for the new age books on on runes and mythology. Study the primary sources and and yeah, figure out how we know what we think we know about a thing. Um, and and for for a person who works with intuitive things as, as art and music. It's, uh, I think 
I find uh, find it to be very valuable to uh, to sort of um, st- have my feet on solid ground before uh, before venturing into the more intuitive parts. Um, yeah. That's that. really interesting. There's one here actually, which is for Steve, but I think both of you could uh, could answer the question. Um, it's would you say that urban landscapes have the same potential for inspiration, whether negative or otherwise? And did those landscapes inspire your earlier, more physically aggressive art? So that one's for you, Steve. Uh, absolutely. I mean, if I think of what it was like growing up as a teenager in the San Francisco Bay Area, you know, which had its kind of uh, musical roots in the 60s, psychedelic movement and, and uh, Oakland being such a, uh, an intense place, you know, the origin of the Black Panther movement, the Hells Angels and all kinds of other social movements. The place had a crazy energy uh, and, and it was a human energy. Um, but there's also, I, I felt there's always something in the water you know, there. And that's why the, the punk bands that came out of, out of that time. And, um, and even that's where the first kind of crossover between metal and punk was happening, which was really exciting to 15 year olds, 14 year olds in the mid eighties. You know, I think that had an, an, um, uh, an incredible inspiration on on where I went and, and even being here right now. Um, now though it's definitely like if i go to the city <laughs> it's i can't wait to get back to my forest you know i don't i needed i don't feel the room to breathe there but i do like the energy off the human beehive once in a while yeah i i i think also that uh sometimes sometimes the the absent absence of of nature can actually bring me closer to it um, because there is an element of longing and longing is that that pain in in longing is very um, it can be a powerful uh, creative tool I would say so so yeah nature itself can can be of course very inspiring but also the the absence of it can be very uh, yeah I agree that lo- that longing in some ways is the the source of most of where I think I pull inspiration from. Yeah, exactly. That's great. And um, Sarah was wondering, actually, this is for Einar, but again, I think both of you could answer this one. Um, If you listen to your own music to calm down and connect with nature, or if you prefer to have peace and quiet? Um, Well, uh, it's, Perhaps not politically correct, but um, uh, I do uh, listen. I do enjoy listening to to my own music. Um, and that's kind of what um, why I why I create it in a, in a way because I, that's what I hear and want to hear at at uh, at the time I'm creating it. Uh, so revisiting that can can be a good tool. But at this, at this I don't know. I, I work so much with uh, with uh, creating music. So um, to be quite honest, I, I don't listen much to music, or I uh, at least I have very long periods where where I don't listen to anything apart from um, the work I'm doing. Uh, but yes, and then sometimes I, I have this craving to listen to music. But um, most of the time, I don't listen to music. Steve? Um, I, I listen to my own music while I'm in the mode of creation. I don't after, probably be because I feel guilty that it's weird <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to listen to. But like you, I mean, all the, the music that I've uh, ever created has been because I felt there was music I wanted to hear that didn't exist. Yeah, exactly. And so it was my duty. Uh, to find it and create it. Uh, usually by the time it's a thing and an object, I've usually moved on to something else. But do you feel, do you feel, um, uh, do you feel your early music still uh, withholds the, the, the two teeth of time? I, I believe so. Although I try not to look back. I mean, being in a band for as long as neurosis has been around, it's hard not to once in a while. Uh, but, um, 
without each rung of the ladder, you didn't get to the next place. So I have a deep respect and gratitude and appreciation for every step along the way, even if some of the earlier stuff feels a bit, you know, uh, immature, or hadn't found a voice yet or whatever. I, I have to have a belief that the best is always yet to come. Uh, Wardruna for me has been a really incredible uh, list journey as a listener because you know, as a, as a young, as a young man in my late teens, early twenties, um, this was the late eighties, early nineties, and just getting into, uh, reading about shamanic traditions around the world and folklore and, and runes and looking for sources as an American on the West coast of the United States. If you would have told me that a, an artist would come within the next 20 years that would be singing in Norse language would be using ancient and historical instruments, but in a new inspiring way, creating something for the future, but not for the past, who would make three albums about the esoteric elder Futhark, which is, is not a well-known thing in, in public knowledge around the world. Um, I would have told you that one, you were crazy, you know, that, that, that there's no way that something that cool could uh, exist. But to also become resonating with so many people that you're, that you're filling good-sized theaters in the United States, which it's not easy to um, bring a non-English language art form that resonates with that many people. I mean, maybe Europe is different. It's more open-minded. But so I, I really, I thank you for tapping into something so deep and so resonant because for me it was what I had always wanted to hear, but didn't know it until, until I did hear it. You know, it was like, oh, this is, this is uh, some deep resonant primal thing, but it's not folk music. It's not some, you know, Renaissance fair <laughs> past stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, this is like vital and, and new. It's nodding to, to the ancient past, but like you said, it's resonating with people right now. So I, do you have any thoughts on why it yeah, resonates well, with so many people. Um, yeah, I do have some thoughts on it, uh, and and it is it is quite crazy and mind blowing uh, when when you start to reflect on it on it and um, um, yeah, quite quite overwhelming. Uh, but I I don't know I I think. Um, I think um, it comes out of a uh, out of that longing. Uh, that's part of it, at least. That that there are so many people longing for some sort of connectiveness uh, to to our surroundings, and and in a nutshell, that's that's what you know. I I, I make songs for runes, but these runes are are um, or in in my way of using them, it, it, they are just uh, images or reflections about different um, yeah, different aspects of, of uh, human relations, of our relation to, to nature and to something that is bigger than yourself. Whether it's a spiritual thing or, or a philosophical thing, doesn't really matter. Um, that's one part of it. And, and the other part is, I think, it's interesting to see that People, people very often react very strongly to it. That's something I noticed the first time I, uh, times I showed the music to people as well, uh, to my close friends or, or family, that they reacted very strongly to it. Um, and that's what we see when we do concerts as well. And it was interesting to see that people uh, in Norway, um, you could see the same reactions, whether or not it was Norway or Brazil or or. Uh, people reacted the same way, the same spots, um, and so on. So it, it, it's tapping into something that is, um, that is uh, sort of uh, uh, transcending these barriers of, of language and, and, uh, and uh, yeah, culture in a, in a sense. We up, up here in, in, in the north, we, we were left alone from from Rome and the Vatican for 
almost thousand years longer than the rest of uh, of Europe, and we got to keep a lot of our our traditions for a, for a longer time. And also, when when Christianity was brought brought to us, um, it, that wasn't a grassroots movement. That came from the top, which meant that most people were just doing <laughs> what they always had been done. Maybe they changed some names, but a lot a lot of the traditions just kept on going. So I think that part of the reason why there are so many people from all over the world who are seeking uh, seeking towards the north and, and uh, Norse tradition and, and culture, I think, think they, they see it as sort of a, a gateway to their own lost pre-Christian uh, traditions uh, because they they are very much connected. All animistic traditions are very much connected um, uh, on, on the fundamental, um, uh, on the principles uh, and, and the fact that they are shaped by nature. Um, so, but yeah, that's kind of my thoughts around it. Um, Excellent, yeah. Well, thank you for uh, channeling that for us. I know many of us appreciate that. Yeah, well, um, it's uh, yeah, it's sort of a thing that um, I couldn't not do it. Um, um, the idea of doing something like that is something I, I started thinking about in my early teens, and, and um, yeah, at, at at some point I just had to do it. And um, when I started, I, I at the time I was also involved in many other bands like Gorgoroth and, and uh, a few other bands that, but I don't know, it, it all, um, it all felt like, uh, it felt very pointless <laughs> in a way, or, or it did, it was, it was work. It wasn't personal uh, and the need to do something that, that came from the heart, uh, that came out of that, that, um, drive that I can't really describe. It's still there, you know, it's, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, uh, I, there is no separation between my, myself and, and the art in, in. Understood. Life. Yeah, completely. Yeah. I think you have it. Um, my impression is that you have it kind of the, the same way. Feels like it, you know, when you, when you surrender to those, those drives, to those forces, when you are, like I said earlier, it, it going with the flow of the river or in alignment with those natural forces of the universe or your own evolution as a human being, you are rewarded for it with yeah. these, these gifts. You know, we, I don't know where poetry, music and art comes from. It definitely feels bigger than myself, uh, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to tap into it once in a while. Um, speaking about poetry, I, I had the chance to to read uh, your uh, fantastic uh, uh, book of poetry, uh, and uh, I was I was wondering if if uh, since I, um, I I'm I try when I write I try to um, or at least in the beginning I try to sort of copy uh, old um like uh, uh i forget the english word for it um well the the metrics the yeah. system, various uh poetic meters and and so on but at, at once i understood them i see that they are so logical they are this this balance between uh, alliteration and end rhyme and in rhyme it's it's very intuitive really when it, once you just um uh, figure it out and, and get in tune with that. Is, is this, are you at all concerned with poetic meters and stuff like that when you, when you create or is it more free? For my own poetry so far, it's been all free. Um, I, I feel like I have a conversational tone in my poetry. It's, it's when I write it, it's the way I would say it. Yeah, if I imagine the way I'm saying the line out loud, that's how I write the line. Mm. Um, and sometimes there's alliteration. Uh, it's, um, it, but it, it's, 
I have tried what you said. Occasionally, I, I even tried to look into some, um, you know, edic uh, meters to wonder, I wonder if I can use this, this meter or this style for my own thing. And I, I felt too, I might still explore it in the future, but I felt too constrained by, um, by the form because I wasn't willing to exer- take the time to get familiar with it enough to have it be natural, like anything, like practicing an instrument. Like you said, once you understood it, it felt natural. But for me, it was more about, um, you know, I'd been writing lyrics for a long time and lyrics are different than poems. They have to, they have to serve the music. I've always written the music first and then the words have to make sense mm. on top of it. Like lists translating a secret code, like wind through the trees well, what's it saying? Mm. Or what vowel sound do I need to hang on? <laughs> you know, yeah, how, yeah. Many, how many syllables does it have to have? And what rhythm, what cadence do I sing it with? Yeah. Whereas a poem is totally different. A poem has to occupy a space on a piece of paper, whether I'm reading it or you're reading it or someone else is reading it and has to have some sort of emotional power with no musical backdrop. Yeah. So... Yeah, and in many ways, I would say almost that the the Eddic poems are are in some ways closer to to how you describe lyrics because um, you have to remember that um, they were born out of an oral tradition. Uh, you weren't really so. Whenever you read an Eddic poem, you have to keep in mind. Um, the missing context. Um, you weren't really supposed to read it. You were supposed to experience it, uh, listen to it, or or uh, or sing it yourself, or say it yourself, or like a uh, drama. Yeah, like a drama. What was it a ritual uh, setting? It was performed, or or all of these things, um, spoken over a crackling fire in a longhouse or in a forest. You know, that's. I always try to to keep in mind those things when I read them or, or try. And, and sometimes I actually don't understand them and, until I try to say them. Um, then I understand um, um, why the words have been chosen in that way and, and kind of understand the, the logics of the meters as well um, as a result of actually trying to sing it. So... That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Sorry, I have a question. Um, If you may, someone is asking um, if you have any favorite poets, either of you, or write. It could be writers too, that's inspired you or that you enjoy reading. Ah, tons. Um, Sylvia Plath comes to mind. the American transcendentalists, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, Whitman, those were kind of like early, early folks in American history who were longing for that reconnection to nature. And they had no idea what was still to come as far as the disconnect, but, uh, you know, um, and, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's too many to, to think of right now. Those are the two off the top of my head. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not so uh, well r- read on on uh, English poetry, uh, but I d- definitely, um, yeah. Uh, of course, a lot of uh, old Attic poetry and Skaldic poetry is something I have uh, have a profound respect for, and and some named skulls and unnamed. Once, I think my my all time favorite uh, poet is uh, um, the Icelandic or Norwegian Icelandic uh, poet um, Egil Skallagrimson, uh, which is uh, yeah from from uh, the, the 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 saga times. That's that's my uh, all time favorite poet. I'm going to jump in and shift a little bit with a question we have from Beth Hogan for Einar asking, will we see new experimentations with media in your live shows exploring this relationship between your music and technology to transport the audience? Um, yeah, that might happen. Um, 
I uh, um, I'm I'm a bit I'm a bit con- conflicted on the matter because I, on one uh, of course using technology or or can be all sorts of things uh, can of course um, enhance enhance parts of it or or enhance the experience you get um, your senses and and can be many things. Um, on the other hand, um, I sometimes experience it myself when I see concert that sometimes if it's too much going on, it sort of takes away um, something from that meeting between between um, audience and, and artist. Uh, so, uh, so far we've tried to to keep it very, um, very minimalistic because the music is so, um, um, yeah, there's a lot of things going on. Um, so it's, it's a fine balance. Um, I think we will try and, and, um, try some new, uh, things in, in, in the time to come, but I think we're gonna ease slowly into it. Um, yeah. That's brilliant. And um, with just a few minutes to go, I think it would be a good moment to maybe just reflect a little bit. We've got some questions about how um, you're both faring with the lockdown situation. Obviously, Steve, you're putting out some of your most ambitious work during this time. And I know you've been extremely prolific, which we want to sort of end on, actually, so you can introduce the video. Um, We've got a couple of minutes. So do either of you have anything to say about your experiences of lockdown and creativity? I just I feel lucky to live where I live. I didn't have to be in an urban situation where I think I felt so cooped up. I mean, obviously, with my teaching job, it was challenging having to teach over technology. But uh, but just being able to walk outside the house and take the dogs on a long walk in the woods, it didn't ever feel like I was uh, cooped up like I, a lot of my friends are in the urban environments. So, yeah, I, I think I I would say say the same thing um in in many ways i i didn't i've been in studio lockdown for uh, for almost a year now <laughs> so the the difference wasn't really uh that big it's been like yeah it's been a really intense um uh, period in in studio both working with yeah finishing off the wadrun album and making the new song and also my work on on the uh, assassin's creed uh, video game that i'm doing now so uh, it's been yeah i i didn't notice it much <laughs> what about the absence of touring because that was obviously a big thing for for Vodruna this year as well yeah uh, of course that was um that that was uh, um i a big disappointment of of course and uh, and of course it was a disappointment to to have to postpone the album and uh, yeah a lot of um logistics and and um um uh, planning going down the drain and uh but yeah i i i've chosen to 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 try and and keep um keep constructive uh, focus um, there are many things in regards to this that um, I have no control over. So um, just just have to to make the best out of it, and and at, at all times just try and be creative and 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 constructive um, with whatever this uh, new situation throws at us. Absolutely. And on that note, maybe you could talk a little bit about the Lifjaberg video which we're going to see next because that was created during lockdown i believe in a short yeah. time tell it, us it more was, about about that yeah it was sort of in in amidst the the disappointment of um of the album being postponed i i um yeah the the need to to create livia bag is is um um it's a place known from from uh, Norse mythology as as 
basically the word means uh, healing mountain or healing hill and it's known from a from a, an old Norse Eddic poem called Fjölsvin Mål as a place for um, for healing or comfort for the sick and sore, um, those who manage to climb climb the mountain and and bear gifts at the shrine there, were um, were cured for their uh, lifelong um, illnesses and and um, yeah, it's it's a sort of a song that I've I've been. Um, thinking about for a long time um which is the case with many songs and um and and at that point uh, the the song came um and um um yeah the time time was right so um so went straight into to creative mode and and spent uh, a few weeks in in april um recording writing and recording it and then um in early may uh we um decided to to do a, a music video for it um and early may even though it's norway it's not it's not supposed to be a half meter uh of snow uh coming towards you sideways uh so that was a kind of a surprise when we we <laughs> we uh came to the place and and basically winter came back to uh, to to visit us so this um i would say it all fell into place the way the way it needed to be because the song is in many ways about well it tells the story about climbing a mountain and and for any of you who have climbed a mountain you a, a tough mountain you know that that's that's a, that's a journey not only a physical journey it's a journey for um, for um, for the mind as well um to 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 endure it um and uh, so, and and i feel that the making of this video as well <laughs> very much reflected that um that that um, the contact content of of the song itself we we all had to climb quite a few of our own inner inner mountains to to get it done um we were basically wading around um in in a half meter up to a meter snow uh, for three days day and night uh, up and down the mountains um cold and wet and um yeah it, it was brutal um and uh kind of a profound experience um in itself in in this landscape that is so uh powerful in itself so being being in that that capsule those days in in those surroundings um was some yeah it's definitely a, an experience i will um will carry for for a long time and and something um yeah, I, I would say I learned quite a bit from it as well on a personal level. Well, it's yeah. uh, it's an amazing work of art, and I think it ties everything in really brilliantly with um, what we've been talking, what you've been talking about with nature and the how it's above and beyond all of us. Um, so yeah, I think we're going to wrap up now, guys. Um, thanks to everyone for their questions, and thanks mostly to you guys for your time and wisdom and what a great conversation um so maybe you could just say a little quick intro to the to the video that people are about to see i know you've just talked about it but just the name of it and um, any other things you'd like to add before we say goodbye i know yeah i would uh, like to say uh, thank you for the invitation to supersonic and and of course thank you to uh, to steve uh, it's been a while since we talked uh, thank you i know yeah, it was it was great to uh, catch up in, in front of an audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but um, yeah, I I hope uh, you guys will um, enjoy um, this um, this uh, metaphorical journey up up the mountain, and and uh, hope uh, whatever mountains 
uh, whether or not they are physical or metaphorical, um, you, you might have in your lives that um, you will all um, manage the climb uh, in a good manner. So, um, yeah, have a great night and I hope you will enjoy the music video. <laughs>